Hello students, this is part one of a two-part video uh, where I'm going to read through a primary source about the Trail of Tears and break it down a little bit as we talk. The primary source that I'm going to read today was written by a soldier who was part of uh, the Trail of Tears. He was one of the soldiers forcing Native Americans, uh, the Cherokee tribe specifically, to move from their tribal lands in Georgia all the way to Oklahoma. And um, he, the letter, the primary source that I'm going to read today was a letter he wrote to his grandchildren uh, decades later expressing how sorry he was that he didn't do more to help the Native Americans, to help the Cherokee tribe, and that he was, um, you know, he, he really still felt bad about the situation decades after the fact. So, um, the the soldier's name is John G. Burnett. Uh, he was a private in the infantry, and he was recruited because he had some experience with the Cherokee tribe and knew the language, and so he was recruited to be part of this. So, here we go. This is John G. Burnett. This is my birthday, December the 11th, 1890. I am 80 years old today. I was born at King's Iron Works in Sullivan County, Tennessee, December the 11th, 1810. I grew into manhood fishing in Beaver Creek and roaming through the forest, hunting the deer and the wild boar and the timber wolf, often spending weeks at a time in the solitary wilderness with no companions but my rifle, hunting knife, and a small hatchet that I carried in my belt in all of my wilderness wanderings. So you see from this first paragraph that he was a... Um, as a young man, he enjoyed the outdoors, and he enjoyed hunting and fishing. On these long trips, I met and became acquainted with many of the Cherokee Indians, hunting with them by day and sleeping around their campfires by night. I learned to speak their language, and they taught me the arts of trailing and building traps and snares. On one of my long hunts in the fall of 1829, I found a young Cherokee who had been shot by a roving band of hunters, and who had eluded his pursuers and concealed himself under a shelving rock. Weak from loss of blood, the poor creature was una unable to walk and almost famished for water. I carried him to a spring, bathed and bandaged the bullet wound, built a shelter out of bark, peeled from a dead chestnut tree, nursed and protected him, feeding him on chestnuts and roasted deer meat. When he was able to travel, I accompanied him to the home of his people and remained so long that I was given up for lost. By this time, I had become an expert rifleman and a fairly good archer, and a good trapper, and spent most of my time in the forest in quest of game. So in this paragraph, you see that he's uh, pointing out that as a young man, he ended up saving an, uh, a Cherokee. Um, he's, he nursed him back to life and went on to spend quite a bit of time uh, with this uh, Native American uh, before he took him back to his, his people, where he stayed for a good while. Um, so, John G. Burnett goes on. The removal of the Cherokee Indians from their lifelong homes in the year of 1838 found me a young man in the prime of life and a private soldier in the American Army. Being acquainted with many of the Indians and able to fluently speak their language, I was sent as an interpreter into the Smoky Mountain country in May 1838 and witnessed the execution of the most brutal order in the history of American warfare. I saw the helpless Cherokees arrested and dragged from their homes and driven at the bayonet point into the stockades, and in the chill of a drizzling rain on an October morning, I saw them loaded like cattle or sheep into 645 wagons and started toward the west. In this paragraph, he transitions from his childhood um, to, as a young man, he was a member of the army and he was um, recruited because of his interpreting skills to um, go along on this journey uh, to force the Cherokee from their homes uh, west. And he describes that last line, he describes, he said, I saw them loaded like cattle or sheep into 645 wagons and started towards the west. Um, just kind of a sad beginning, but uh, we're going to hear some sad, some continued sad uh, parts of the story as we go on. In the next paragraph, 
Uh, John Burnett says, One can never forget the sadness and the solemnity of that morning. Chief John Ross led in prayer, and when the bugle sounded and the wagons started rolling, many of the children rose to their feet and waved their little hands goodbye to their mountain homes, knowing that they were leaving them forever. Many of these helpless people did not have blankets, and many of them had been driven from their homes barefooted. So here they're about to make a an 800-mile cross country trip to from Georgia to Oklahoma in the winter and many of them don't have blankets or uh, shoes. He would go on to say, on the morning of November 17th we encountered a terrific sleet and snowstorm with freezing temperatures and from that day until we reached the end of the fateful journey on March 26, 1839, the sufferings of the Cherokees were awful. The trail of the exiles was a trail of death they had to sleep in the wagons and on the ground without fire. And I have known as many as 22 of them to die in one night of pneumonia due to ill treatment, cold, and exposure. Among this number was the beautiful Christian wife of Chief John Ross. This noble-hearted woman died a martyr to childhood, giving her only blanket for the protection of a sick child. She rode thinly clad through the blinding sleet and snowstorm developed pneumonia and died in the still hours of a bleak winter night, with her head resting on Lieutenant Gregg's saddle. So in this paragraph, John Burnett points out that the wife of the chief, his name was John Ross, the wife of Chief John Ross died because she gave up her blanket, her, her coat, her blanket, uh, for a young child that needed the warmth in a sleet storm. And she dies... A few days later, he also notes that as many as 22 people died each night uh, from the cold and the exposure. He would go on to say, I made the long journey to the west with the Cherokees and did all that a private soldier could do to alleviate their sufferings. When on guard duty at night, I have many times walked by, walked my beat in my blouse in order that some sick child might have the warmth of my overcoat. I was on guard duty the night Mrs. Ross died. When relieved at midnight, I did not retire, but remained around the wagon out of sympathy for Chief Ross, and at daylight was detailed by Captain McClellan to assist in the burial, like the other unfortunates who died on the way. Her uncoffined body was buried in a shallow grave by the roadside, far from her native mountain home, and the sorrow, the sorrowing cavalcade moved on. Think about this for one second. The bodies were buried in shallow graves because they didn't take the time to bury them properly. And those shallow graves were then left, um, those shallow graves were then left uh, to any grave robbing animals that might come along and dig up the bodies to eat them because of how shallow they were. He would go on to say, being a young man, I mingled freely with the young women and girls. I have spent many pleasant hours with them when I was supposed to be under my blanket, and they have many times sung their mountain songs for me, this being all they could do to repay my kindness. And with all my association with Indian girls from October 1829 to March, 18, March 1839, I did not meet one um, who was not kind and tender-hearted, and many of them are beautiful. The only trouble that I had with anybody on the entire journal, on the entire journey to the West, was a brutal teamster by the name of Ben McDonald, who was using his whip on an old feeble Cherokee to hasten him into the wagon. The sight of that old and nearly blind creature quivering under the lashes of the bullwhip was too much for me. I attempted to stop McDonald and, in the end, had a personal encounter with him. He lashed me across the face the wire tip of his whip cutting a bad gash in my cheek. The little hatchet that I carried in my hunting days was in my belt, and MacDonald was carried unconscious from the scene. Now, if you didn't follow this last uh, story here, basically what happened was um, our guy, John Burnett, he encountered uh, basically the beating of an old Indian man by one of the other soldiers. And uh, so he decided to stop it. He tried to step in and stop it. And McDonald was having none of it. And he actually whipped John Burnett in the face and cut a deep gash. 
But the last sentence here kind of gives away what happens next. The little hatchet that I had carried in my hunting days was in my belt, and MacDonald was carried unconscious from the scene. In other words, John Burnett, our guy, was not going to tolerate this, and when a, he was whipped across the face, he took out his hatchet and used the blunt end of it, not the sharp end, but the blunt end of it, to hit McDonald and knocked him unconscious. Now, the next paragraph is going to get into whether or not he got in trouble for this, which is uh, something that probably by military code should have happened because he um, struck a, an officer. So let's see what happens in the next paragraph. I was placed under guard, but Ensign Henry Bullock and Private El Elkanah Millard had both witnessed the encounter. They gave Captain McClellan the facts, and I was never brought to trial. Years later, years later, I met Second Lieutenant Riley and Ensign Bullock at Bristol at John Robertson's show, and Bullock jokingly reminded me that there was a case still pending against me before a court-martial, and wanted to know how much longer I was going to have the trial put off. McDonald finally recovered, and in the year 1851 was running a boat out of Memphis, Tennessee. So, John G. Burnett is not held responsible for striking McDonald because the witnesses proved that it was more self-defense than anything. He goes on, The long, painful journey to the West ended March 26, 1839, with 4,000 silent graves, reaching from the foothills of the Smoky Mountains to what is known as Indian Territory in the West. And covetous on the part of the white race was the cause of the Cherokees' suffering. The word covetousness means to um, desire someone else's, something someone else has that you don't have. Even since Ferdinand de Soto made his journey through Indian country in the year of 1540, there, have been a, there had been a tradition of a rich gold mine somewhere in the Smoky Mountain country, and I think the tradition was true. At a festival at Achada, on oh, Christmas night, 1829, I danced and played with Indian girls who were wearing ornaments around their necks that looked to be made of gold. In the year of 1828, a little Indian boy living on Ward Creek had sold a gold nugget to a white trader, and that nugget sealed the doom of the Cherokees. In a short time, the country was overrun with armed brigands claiming to be government agents who paid no attention to the rights of Indians who were the legal possessors of the country. Crimes were committed that were a disgrace to civilization. Men were shot in cold blood. Lands were confiscated. Homes were burned and the inhabitants driven out by these gold-hungry brigands. So here John Burnett is describing that a possible cause of the Trail of Tears and the Cherokee and the other four tribes being driven off their land was that gold was found in the mountains of Georgia. He would go on to tell a story of Andrew Jackson um, being saved by a Native American. Chief Junaluska was personally acquainted with Andrew Jackson. Junaluska had taken 500 of the flower of his Cherokee scouts and helped Jackson to win the battle of Horseshoe, leaving 33 of them dead on the field. And in that battle, Junaluska, Junaluska had drove his tomahawk through the skull of a Creek warrior when the Creek had Jackson at his mercy. So, this paragraph is telling you that during the Creek War, the Cherokee had fought on the side of the Americans with Andrew Jackson. And during that battle, during that battle, a Creek warrior had Jackson at his mercy, could have killed Andrew Jackson, but Jackson was saved by Chief Junaluska of the Cherokee. And that is where we're going to pick up the next video, part two, finishing this primary source by John G. Burnett.